everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and in this game overview and gameplay video, I'm going to be checking out Euthia Torment of Resurrection. Now, what is Euthia Torment of Resurrection all about? Well, it's a competitive strategic board game where you're going to take on the role of one of five heroes. Of course, if you're playing in a solo capacity like I will be doing today, your hero is going to wander through an open world of fantasy landscape represented by the modular tile-based maps that you will see as we break things out you'll see the church there in the center and on each turn players are going to use action tokens which can be spent on either combat trade mining or use for movement now there is an array of strategic options in here for you to try and progress further you're going to choose from a wide range of armor weapons spells magical jewelry and an open play style allows for every hero to play the way they choose so in this particular playthrough i've already gone ahead and selected Selected my character and we'll talk more about that character in a moment but first let's find out what scenario we're playing and then we'll put a little bit of a focus on some of the rule changes you need to know from page 31 as a solo gamer here is a look at the first scenario in the booklet and it's worth mentioning this scenario is the recommended one the first time you play the game it's called the hunt the introduction is in the top left there and it will let you know that this book is going to contain rules for all the different Different scenarios so it has a little bit of narrative text there it tells you the game length the goal the setup rules special rules and final scoring the narrative of the hunt states like a heavy rain the ferocious monsters flooded the land even people living in the previously safe neighborhoods of the church are scared to death and refuse to go out day and night it is time to hunt these creatures down the game length clocks in at seven game rounds total we have a goal to defend Defeat level two monsters. So we're going to be trying to take out as many of those level two monsters as we possibly can. Setup rules dictate that the starting map tile is the one with the church, which I've placed in the middle. And you're going to go ahead and create a map tile stack according to the chart just off camera there to the right. Now this chart is broken down based on the tile icon. You'll see those icons on the left hand side also by the player count and then how you're going to set up per chapter throughout this particular scenario. So in this scenario there's chapters one, two, and three. In some of the other scenarios you'll go even beyond that. But you'll see for one player count it tells you exactly how many to add in and it is worth mentioning you should check the solo rules section on page 31 as it dictates a couple changes around how you're going to go ahead and build out your tile deck. I've already gone ahead and done this, but be sure you don't miss it on your own. Now, underneath the setup rules, which I read quite quickly, you'll also see that each player begins the game with a healing potion. So my character has that in his bag. The special rules indicate whenever you defeat a level two monster, you may take it as a trophy as normal, which means you can go ahead and place it into one of your bag slots. And if you do, whenever you would discard it or either to use it to fulfill a quest or just remove it to make space in this case only for this scenario you're going to keep the monster card face down near your hero board instead of discarding it uh, similarly if you choose not to take the monster as a trophy you still keep the card face down so really what this is saying is typically you will kill monsters keep them as trophies and potentially cash them in as one of the trophies in one of the bag slots you can see off to the left there but for this scenario because we're purposely trying to take out as many level two monsters as possible it's a-okay to actually keep these trophies off to the side and just collect them without them actually taking up bag slots. Last but not least, down at the bottom, it says final scoring. In addition to normal scoring, which we'll take a look at in just a moment, each hero is going to gain two reputation for each level two monster they defeated during the game. So again, we're on a time crunch trying to take out as many level two monsters as possible. And the more we get, the more reputation we're going to gain. Here is one of a number of really handy reference cards you're going to want to keep close by after consuming the rulebook and maybe even this video in order to get a better understanding of how to play. This will help you with the scoring in Endgame and will also help you make crucial decisions as you move through the scenario yourself. So you'll see across the top there is a number of icons here. We'll talk about each of them but the one that's most important is the one on the far right hand side, the gold star. That is reputation. So you'll see if you go row by row down from the star you've got 2, 5, 9, and 15. So you get that much reputation based on how many of the tokens or things you've 
triggered during gameplay. So let's talk about those starting with the far left hand side. Now just before I begin with that gray shield icon, I want to tell you how this ties into the tokens I have for my hero. You'll notice the hero tray just below has a number of tokens inside. You can ignore the damage markers, those are quite obvious, the blood drops, but the other three spots all have shapes. And if you look at those shapes, you'll see hex, you'll see a shield kind of shape, and almost a half moon. Not really exactly a half moon, but very close. If you look at the very top of the scoring icons, you'll see they match up. Now let's actually go through them so you get an idea as to what these are and when they're used. So the shield shaped tokens are considered hero tokens. You're gonna to use these to mark treasures you've gathered, liberated hexes that are not mining hexes or places of trade. The next column is that gray hex, and these are interaction tokens. You're gonna to use these to mark elementals and mining hexes. You can even see examples of that just below in my tray. Next up is the trade token. So liberating merchants or alchemists and hexes around dragon slayer towers. You'll use those tokens in my tray to the far right that have the matching shape. And then you'll see another column right next to it with an asterisk and in very small writing at the very bottom it says, you're gonna basically as a player lose two reputation for each time your hero was killed in combat. So that's worth mentioning as a negative in this whole thing. And then next you see the question mark that is gonna be around cards you fulfilled for quests. And then finally elite monsters, the number of elite monsters you've defeated. As I alluded to earlier in the video, Video, this solo game section of the rulebook starting on page 31 and onwards is very important to consume to not only ensure that you set up the game correctly for solo play but you also understand how combat works. Now we're not going to get into specifics around this whole section beyond just the setup stuff here. I wanted to show you this up close so you can at least read it if you're interested in seeing how the tile deck was comprised and built. I won't be actually doing this all right here in front of the camera because I want to get right into the gameplay to show you how this thing operates but ensure that you're referencing this section to make sure that you're selecting fixed map tiles per chapter for solo play. Now, that might sound like a bad thing because if you have fixed map tiles, then you might be seeing the same map tiles all the time, you would think, but there's still a whole bunch of variability built in and a bunch of random tiles that get added in per chapter as well. There's just specific ones for solo play that need to be a part of each chapter. Now, you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner of the rulebook, it says silver and gold cards. And what this section is talking about is something very important for solo play. You essentially have a silver deck, as you can see on screen there to the right, and a gold deck. Now, the game is going to start with one silver card in the cache. The silver cache now has a card inside of it from the start of the game as it's supposed to. So what is this silver cache? What is it doing? Well, it's basically preparing to be used during combat against you. It's going to be used by the enemies. It'll be flipped and revealed to create stacks, which are going to go up against you and create all kinds of nastiness and problems for you. Now, how do you manage these caches? Well, it's actually quite simple. As I mentioned, at the start of the game, you place one silver card in the cache. So that's all you have to do and you can dive right into your gameplay. But from that moment forward, anytime the game tells you to draw a silver card for yourself into your hand, you also take a corresponding card from the same deck and place it in the cache. So if you gain a silver card, that's one silver card going into the cache. If you gain two gold cards, that's two gold cards going into the cache. So what's the difference between the silver cache and the gold cache? The gold cache is a lot nastier. You really don't want to see a ton of those in there, but it's going to happen. That's the way the game scales up and really throws some pretty nasty attacks your way and changes the way the combat flows during those encounters with enemies. Now, the thing to note is as soon as you get four silver cards in the cache, you're going to immediately take those cards, place them to the bottom of the silver deck, and you're going to draw one gold card. And in this way, you're constantly making the enemies stronger over time. The final thing we need to talk about is the character that I've chosen. As you can see, this individual is clearly a wizard and has a staff of fire to start the game off. In the top right hand corner has a potion in one of his bag slots. In the bottom right hand corner, you'll see four blue tokens. Those are gar tokens. You'll see how handy those are in the near future. They really help with die rolling and mitigation of those rolls, which I absolutely love that particular mechanic in the game. And then right down 
down the middle, you have your health track. Your maximum is set based on the heart, which sits just one above where the top of the red column sits. So for this character, six is the maximum health. So the red heart just sits just above it to let you know where your maximum is. And then on an angle there on the side, you have a hero token that denotes what your actual hero health is currently at, which we're, of course, at full health starting off the game. Then down in the bottom middle, we have action tokens. You'll see three spaces filled in and one is empty. Basically, in a typical game turn, if you don't use up all your action tokens, you can actually save one of those tokens in that fourth position for your next turn, which can really help strategize and allow you multiple options going into the next round of play. And then on the left-hand side of the board, we have, forgetting about the Staff of Fire for the moment, one available open slot, so long as the item has these icons. And then we have four lock slots that we need to actually unlock by paying to get access to them or using essences, for instance, to unlock them. It's kind of an either or situation there. And then finally, an area for our gold as we gain it throughout the game. We also have additional action tokens, spares here, and we have a token to denote how much extra movement we might have because this game allows you to move and break up your movement on the way. You also have your miniature, which corresponds to the character you've chosen, as well as color-coded dice. There's two of them. The other thing you're going to need for solo play that's worth keeping handy is just another set of hero dice to use for when you reveal the combat cards specific to the enemy. So for me currently, I just went ahead and grabbed two yellow dice to use in combat. So without further ado, let's go ahead and place our wizard on the church and begin our adventure in the hunt. It's worth noting that these special tiles that actually have a location dead center in the middle of them actually have their own space right in the middle. So, in other words, if I want to actually get some movement, which I'll show you that in just a few moments, I have to move from the church to one of the outer hexes around it, one of the three options around it. However, if I'm in one of those three options, I can also just move from the outer regions to each other. So I can kind of do a circular pattern around the church. I don't have to go through it but when you're at the church you have to move out of it in order to get moving and the other thing to make note of is of course if you actually move back to the church you can't access the church unless you actually move to the middle of the tile. Just before I go ahead and take my very first actions of the game, I want to show you guys the beginning of each round, player's turn, end of round, and end of game. This is a reference card that sums these things up at a high level. So beginning my turn here, I'm going to go ahead and choose one of the action tokens in order to spend it for either movement on the very top of the token, based on the number that's on it, so one, two, or three. And then down below, I have an alternate option for that action token, where I could do something starting left to right, my Mining action, trade action, or combat action. I'm going to go ahead and use the middle one at the very top there for two movement rather than the market action because I want to get moving and explore the world to see what's around me. So we simply discard that token from the area. We're gonna to go to the game board now and we're gonna do some movement from the church. So at this point, I have two movement to spend. I'm gonna use one movement to move from the center of the special tile at the church to one of the three outer edges. You'll notice in the bottom right, there is a blue portal in the bottom right hand corner. I'm actually gonna move down to that location and for free, I can actually move through that portal to another portal if of course there was one actually on the map. We won't know yet until I start revealing tiles. And how does that happen? Well, the second you move to one of the outer edges of a tile, so one of the three outer edges here in this case, of course one of them is hiding behind the miniature, then the second you're on that edge you're going to instantly reveal tiles until you're completely surrounded by them. We've moved out of the church and we'll go ahead and reveal the top tile from the tile deck and I'm going to build things out in a pattern starting in the top right and then curving all the way down to the lower left. Now at the very top top of every single tile you're going to see an arrow that's going to help you understand how to place the tile in the position so as I mentioned I wanted to start in the top right and work my way around until there is a tile next to me 
all the way around where my miniature currently resides. So we have the first one in place. Now, just behind the miniature, which you can faintly see, there is actually an elemental there. The Air Elemental miniature is now in place. The rule book does not tell you to go ahead and place a miniature here because the tile itself already has a picture of the Air Elemental to let you know it's there. But I do this as a visual reminder, plus it's also kind of nice to do it on camera. So you guys notice it and it pops it a little bit more. Plus it's a great reminder because elementals actually have impacts when you're either in the same hex as an elemental or if you're adjacent to it. We'll talk more about that as we go along because we still need to build out all the tiles surrounding the one that I'm currently standing on. So here are a couple more locations and we'll talk about the specifics around this soon, but you'll notice another portal shown up. The world around us has expanded. We have many more options to interact with and we'll talk about what each of these are and you're gonna see examples of them as we go through the gameplay here. But I wanted to make mention also of a token here. You'll see a boot with a one on it and that represents how much movement we have left. So there are tokens in the game to help you remember how much movement points you still have because as you can see, when I used my original action token that had two movement on it, I only used one to move where I did and then had to do a whole bunch of revealing of tiles and actually we're not done with the rest of what needs to be revealed at this point so in order to remember I still have one extra movement to spend after all this revealing and resolving and then we just place that token nearby so we make sure we don't miss it. Now let's quickly talk about a number of different things that have popped up that are new. At the very top to the north of the elemental, you'll see a mountain range there with no iconography at all on it. That means it's wide open for mining. So we could go there to gain resources and not have to worry about any enemies. So where are the enemies? Well, anywhere you see that animal icon with a sword through it, whether it be one sword, two sword, or three sword, and that depicts the different levels and difficulty of the enemies, giving you kind of a heads up as to what you're potentially running into those areas are essentially well they're not liberated yet they are controlled by the enemy that's there so you can see that one of the locations there in red just to the right of me is a merchant location but i can't interact or do anything at the merchant until i liberate it from the enemy that's there the other locations to the northeast and the southwest are basically woodland areas which are just areas i could go into the wild to try and find a particular uh, creature or enemy to maybe even try and gain a trophy towards a quest or something along those lines. You're not going to liberate anything by attacking something there, but you still will get endgame scoring points for doing so. Now, the other thing I want to mention here is as soon as you're revealing tiles and you see a question mark, that opens up the door on quests. So knowing that we revealed a quest hex with a question mark, we need to find the back of the encounter cards that match the exact same picture that's on the hex. So you can see at the very top of the deck, I've place those cards to make it easy. If I was to thumb through this deck, there's many different types of quest locations. So you're going to grab all the cards that correspond to this type of quest, and you're going to separate them out. And then you're going to reference the solo play rules section, page 31 and onwards. There is a place in there that talks about what you need to do in order to set up this quest. So to give you an example of different type of encounter card backs, I've actually pulled out the deck of cards that correspond to the same art that's on the quest we've revealed. So we'll go through that in a second, but you'll notice completely different art on the back of the cards of the larger deck. So you're just going to keep this deck all combined, but still organized by card back for all those encounter cards, because at any moment in time, you're going to need to go fish those out. But it's really the setup of these quests that's quite interesting. There are seven cards per different area, or encounter card type. So now that I have this seven, what it says in page 31 of the rule book in the solo rule section, so make sure you don't miss this, you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna shuffle this pile and you're going to remove four of the cards at random without looking. And then the remaining three, you're just gonna reveal the top two, place them face up. Those are gonna be different things you can go after to complete the quest at this location. And the other one is gonna be face down. You won't, you won't know what that one is until until you actually complete one of the other ones. So in this way, every time you play the game, you're actually removing specific encounter cards out of the equation that won't come back in for that play, keeping each game fresh if you were to replay the same scenario multiple times over and over and over because that same area wouldn't have the exact same quests every single time. In terms of placement around the game board for this setup per the different quests you may run into or locations you can actually cash in quests, 
pass. Uh, you can place these cards wherever it makes the most sense. For now, I'll place it as close to the quest as possible. If we happen to reveal a lot more of what's going on to the west, we're going to have to move this around. But we've got two quests face up and one face down, so a total of three cards remaining out of the seven, four of them randomly stripped away and pulled out and will not come back in this play. And then, of course, we have one mystery card there face down, as I mentioned. So let's talk about the ones that are revealed because these are the ones we can actively try and accomplish. Wanted to mention something else to help close the loop on what this quest is all about. This specific location, in terms of its artwork, depicts a hunter. So you can see here that the majority, if not all, of the cards, if I was to flip them face up, are going to be about going after monsters in the world, taking them down, bringing them back as trophies in order to gain a hunter reward tile. You can see at the very bottom of the card, the reward state, you're going to draw two hunter reward tiles and be able to keep one of them, which is why there's a difference in colors there. And then there's also a reputation bump, which is also going to happen. So that's kind of a nice plus. Now, in terms of what you need to accomplish each of these quests, it's an or statement across the board. So you'll see three different creatures depicted on each quest. You can go after one of them if you want to on any of the cards, and that will satisfy the requirements of the card, as you can see a slash between them. So you can choose. You don't need to bring back all three. So we could go after, for example, in the first cards, like a dragonfly or a grizzly or on the second card we could go after a gecko or a shadow beast you know those are the kind of things we're going to be keeping an eye out for depending on what enemies we run into if we happen to get one that lines up we should probably run back here and cash things in so we're done revealing and resolving based on our movement of one to just really open up the world and options around us, giving us all kinds of different things to think about in terms of what we can interact with. But I want to tie one thing together, and that is I talked about the mountain range way up north there. doesn't have any iconography on it. I can freely go there and mine so long as I actually have the mining action available on my turn. And of course, I'm actually in that hex. But I wanted to also talk about the one way down there in the southwest corner, because that one actually has an enemy depicted a level one enemy and you might be wondering what are all these icons sitting around that particular uh, animal with the sword through it those are going to be rewards you can expect to gain after tackling an enemy in those locations so you can specifically go after locations that will give you money or in the case of the mountain range down the bottom uh, you know bottom southwest side of things you're going to get two guard tokens and a potion so there are things you can specifically go after but it's also worth mentioning beyond the stuff that's revealed in terms of rewards right here, you're going to gain additional rewards for taking things out that are actually on the backs of each of the different levels of enemies. So when you did your setup originally, you're going to have three decks of cards. And as I mentioned, level one, two, and three based on the swords depicted. But you're going to see right on the cards themselves what your reputation level needs to be at in order to even gain the reward. And this is really, really interesting. So you can actually have confrontations with enemies and not be at the right reputation to gain the reward that's depicted on the back of the card. So very interesting. You can kind of see what reward you're going to get out of it, but not really really know what the enemy is going to be on the opposite side you have to deal with, but you can kind of make a decision as to whether it's worth the effort before you even get involved. So for instance, if we were looking at a level two monster here, you'll see that in order to gain the reward depicted here, which is for reputation, as well as a silver card, which we know if we gain a silver card, one silver, uh, an additional silver card would go into the cash for solo play, but you'll see it depicts zero to 35. That means that our reputation must be inside that window for us to gain the reward. And seeing as this ties in and we're on this side of the table, I might as well make mention of the fact that you're tracking your rounds. And we know for this scenario, we have seven rounds. So you'll see the inner track there is for the rounds and the outer track is going to be for your reputation. So if we happen to encounter that level two enemy right at the gates, which isn't going to happen at this moment because we don't have any available spots where a level two enemy could pop up, I could actually gain the rewards from this because my reputation is between zero and 35 right now. All right, so all explanations aside, you can still see that there's a bunch of tiles you need to resolve when you get to the edge of the map or the world, and you need to basically pull out cards for the quests. So while doing all this, it's very easy to forget how much additional movement you had. So thank goodness we have that token to remind us we should still move one more and make use of it.
Now this is actually quite interesting because I talked earlier on about the fact you can actually travel through portals for free. And I'm standing on a portal space and we happen to have actually revealed another portal. So I could, as long as I'm happy with maybe being able to move one space away from where the portal is, giving me essentially two visible options right now in the future, the merchant, which I need to liberate by going after the enemy there, or that wooded area there to the west, I could actually use a free action, just jump to that portal, reveal a whole bunch more tiles, and then make a decision from there. Why not? I mean, more options, more visibility has got to be a good thing. I've already begun to reveal tiles around my character. So in the top right hand corner there, we have a space with an elemental actually. We have a location we can mine, but there's an enemy there. And we have another portal, which raises the question, I'm sure you're wondering, could you just continually traverse through portals endlessly, basically exploring an obscene amount of stuff really, really quickly? Well, yes and no. Uh, there is a restriction around this. So when you do go through a portal like I just did, if I want to use the same portal that I'm currently standing on again, I'd have to move off of the tile to an adjacent hex and then come back into it to make use of it. So yes, you can, but you of course would be burning through your actions at a faster pace and not being maybe as productive, but you certainly could really open up visibility to the map if you wanted to. There's also another elemental over here. And again, I'm just placing the miniature just to visually depict it even more obviously. And again, there is a negative to this air elemental that's gonna constantly be kind of a pest to not only myself, but to any enemies when we're going through combat. I'll talk about what they do once we get to that point. The newly revealed tile has an alchemist building in purple, which is adjacent to us to the east and to the southeast. We have a hole in the ground, which is actually a treasure, treasure tile. We'll be able to dig up something valuable there potentially. And then even further southeast, we have a wilderness area there where we can go hunt for some monsters. And that one would give us a silver card, a gar token, which you'll see how those are used later and some money. The last tile to be revealed has a mountain range adjacent to us. We could potentially mine, but have to deal with an enemy there first. We also have a treasure tile area there in the far south, another treasure area to deal with that we could go get something from. And then a wilderness area that has an enemy. Now you'll notice on that one that states four gold in the very, very south region there also has two silver card fish showing. So there's a few of these around the map. So you probably are wondering, and I've probably talked about this, but haven't really pinned down for you exactly Exactly what these cards do when they're in your hand versus actually handling the cash for the AI. Now we understand how the cash for the AI works in terms of stocking that up every time you draw a silver card you put one in the cash. That concept's pretty straightforward. So what do you do as a solo player when you're gaining these silver and gold cards into your hand as a reward after taking out one of the enemies? Well if you get four silver cards you're going to be able to discard all of them to gain one gold which will go onto your character character's player board and you of course can use this to spend and purchase things. If you ever have a gold card you can of course discard that to gain one gold or you could use them for any special rules of the chosen scenario. There isn't any special rules around it in the hunt scenario but other scenarios will make use of them. The final thing I want to point out before we continue our turn here is you'll notice we've gone through every single tile for chapter number one at this point. So we have fully revealed enough tiles to see all the chapter one elements laid out in front of us. And it's really up to us now to go into the land, explore, choose what we want to interact with, and try to build up our character to be able to handle what's coming in chapter number two. And of course, we know our main goal here with the hunt is to take out level two monsters. We're only going to find them by exploring even further than we already have. Now, before we get a bit too aggressive and continue exploring, trying to find level two monsters, we really want to get ourselves ready for those fights because they're not going to be easy. You're not going to be able to just hop, skip over level one areas and just assume you can just dive into level two and it's going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be. So you want to build your character up, level them up and that kind of thing, work towards that and also maybe gain some more items and bolster your character overall. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and try and liberate the merchant's area, which is essentially almost dead center in the middle of the map, just to adjacent to us. So with our last movement point that we kept on that token, we're going to spend it right now to head back to the merchant location, which is going to trigger a battle instantly. 
Now there's one thing you need to check before you move into a location with one of those animal icons uh, with a sword through it to instantly go into a battle with it. And that is you need to have an action token down below, which is available that has the combat symbol on it of two swords crossed. If you don't have that token available, you can't even move into the space where that combat would occur. So keep that in mind. You're going to have to strategically choose which token to use at what times, whether it be for movement or for the action at the bottom you plan to do later in your turn. Seeing as I have this token, no issues, we'll go ahead and discard it and we're going to begin our very first combat. There are a few things you need to do before combat begins. First, you're going to reset the Die of Hope. You'll see the Die of Hope sitting on a card just down below at the bottom of this shot. It currently has two hands raised up, and the other sides of the die count from one to five, where you can basically have this die increment depending on the rolls that you get, whether rolling for the enemy or rolling for your hero can potentially uptick this die and give you benefits that are listed out below on the card. Now right now at this step all you're doing is making sure that the die face is showing essentially zero or those hands. At this point you can also choose to equip and unequip things as you wish and outside of combat items can be used as well as abilities. Now at this point in time I don't have any of that I have to worry about. We're pretty early on in the play so we can skip right into combat setup. The very first thing we need to do is to reveal the monster and take a look at its elements. So as we talked about before, you're going to take a look at the location you're in, determine what enemy level you need to draw from, and that's going to be the level one deck in this case. So the top card off the top deck here in the shot is the one we need to grab. It appears we found a gecko, a level one gecko, which is currently causing us issues at the merchant. Now, if we can liberate the merchant from this gecko, we'll be able to actually interact with it. So let's go ahead and take a look at the card, the specific iconography on it. I'll explain what you need to do around setup here. There are a number of icons across the top of the card. The most obvious one in the top left is the health of the creature. Just below the name of the creature, you'll see a bunch of icons. And the one on the far left starts with the silver and or gold cards that need to be drawn into the cache for this particular character. So in this case, it doesn't add any cards from those decks into the cache prior to this combat. So we're just going to be going in with what we know as the one silver from the beginning game setup. Next up we have the number of chaos tokens we're going to put next to this enemy and then beside that the gar tokens how many that this creature is going to get of those. The two chaos tokens have been placed and at the very bottom of the card you'll also see how much damage is going to be coming your way depending on where the roll lands for this enemy. It's also important to note that let's say, for instance, I have the one, which I do currently have silver card in the cache. If this card came up and said to put three more silver cards in the cache, at this point, we would then do what I talked about earlier, which is taking four silver cards total and putting them to the bottom of the deck and then drawing a gold card. We now go ahead and check it for first strike. You'll see on the combat reference card here that the first strike section to the right of it has a number of icons. Those are the ones you're looking for on any weapons or abilities that you currently have, either yourself or the monster, to determine if somebody gets the first strike. Now we're going to glaze right past this quite quickly because I only have the Staff of Fire and I don't have any extra abilities, but you can see icons on these tiles, so that's where you'd be looking for the icons you just saw in the previous shot. Now it's also worth mentioning that combat card that I just showed is not an accurate representation of how the solo combat will pan out. So I highly recommend picking up a downloadable PDF of the combat round. It'll run you through all of the solo focus combat that you need to check for piece by piece in a flow chart. So that's going to be made available in the future as well, if not already. And that was something that while I was playing through the game, I thought would be really, really useful for solo gamers to have as a reference as the combat reference card that comes inside the game is catering more so to having multiple players around the table. 
The next step at this point is the hero healing phase, and in this phase you can use potions or scrolls, gems or essences, items or abilities to try to heal yourself up in preparation for the combat. So if I had gone into this combat with really low health, if it wasn't having my hero token currently on 6 and say it was down here at 4 or 3 and I thought I was at risk of potentially not pulling it out, then I might want to go ahead and use that potion I have in my bag slot. Moving into the monster attack phase, we now go ahead and essentially turn off or discard any cards with clover effects. And clover effects, as you can see from the symbol or iconography reference here, in the right side about five rows down, the clover is a modification to the hero roll. So at this point, those things would fall off. We're going to reveal the top card of the combat deck. You can see it up there in the top right. And we're going to set the monster dice, which of course can be any two hero dice that aren't currently in play, onto the card itself. The combat card resulted in a total of 9, a 3, and a 6. The dice are placed here to represent the initial numbers because, as you're going to see, they can change. At this point in time, you're going to check for a couple things. If the hero player, myself, happened to have had an air essence and actually used it earlier, then the left die is going to be removed from the card. So that's going to significantly help you out. The next thing you're going to check is for the intervention die just to the left of the shot. Now the sum of the two yellow dice for the enemy is nine. If we take a look at the intervention card, you're going to see two different sets or ranges of numbers on top of each other. One is for a hero roll check, which we'll do later on when the hero does the roll. But right now we only have the roll results from the enemy. So we're checking the very bottom, which again corresponds to that animal icon. It says 10 to 12, and we got a nine. So because the enemy didn't get a 10 to 12, we don't get to uptick the die of hope right now. The reason this thing even exists, this intervention die of hope, is to basically balance out or counteract the fact of having a super high roll from the enemy, and also to help you out if you have a really low roll as a hero, as we'll see later on. Next, we check to see if there's an air elemental power in play, and that's going to occur if you're adjacent to an air elemental or even in the same space as one. You'll see that I am adjacent to one, based on where I'm currently sitting, at the merchant location right next to one of the air elementals. What's going to happen in this case, now that we're in a combat, is the monster dice are going to change values. So we're going to turn the one with the highest value to the opposite side. As you can see, this works in our favor, at least for now. We haven't gotten to the hero portion of this combat yet, but you can see this automatically changes the result of the enemy's attack. The air is constantly affecting everything around it, and so it has a negative effect even on enemies. Next, we check to see if there's an Earth Elemental power in play. There is not. If there was, then we would be adding two to the combat value. So just as a heads up, the air essence check, the intervention check, the air elemental power check, and the earth elemental power check, as well as what you're about to see with guard tokens, chaos actions, and performing chaos actions are all detailed inside the solo section on pages 31 through to 33. That's going to give you everything you need to understand it, but I'm going to be explaining it as we go through this. Now that we know the combat value for the enemy, we know it's a total of four based on the dice. We take a look at the gecko card. You'll see the range is there two to nine. So we obviously sit with a four right in there, which means we'd be doing two damage to the hero, but things aren't crunched out just yet. The actual enemy has the ability to use guard tokens at this point and then chaos actions in order to make this attack even more deadly. Now for the gecko, as you'll see in the top right hand corner of the card there, the icon for the gar, which looks like a rune with a blue symbol inside of it, it's a zero. We didn't place any gar tokens at all, which means this enemy doesn't have the availability to spend gar tokens to get any kind of advantage whatsoever, even if gar tokens were depicted on the combat card down below. So as you can see below the dice, it's going to let you know what the enemy is going to plan to consume in order to bolster its attack against you. So if there had have been an actual guard token noted for the gecko on its card, we would have placed it next to the two chaos tokens. And if we had to flip the combat card up, which we got, and it actually had a gar symbol sitting right in here along with the chaos token, for instance, then we would be actually resolving and spending the guard token we have. Again, it doesn't 
doesn't matter what's actually on this card. If we don't have the tokens to actually spend to do it, it won't happen. As a hypothetical example, let's say that the Gecko actually had a Gar token from the very beginning, and let's also pretend that there's a Gar token down in that combat card. So at this point in time, the monster would actually use that Gar token, and what would it gain? Well, the lowest die that shows either a 1, 2, or 3 is going to have the Gar token spent in order to re-roll the lowest die. And then the Gar token itself counts for plus 2 on top of the combat value total. So we would take a look at the dice for the enemy. One is obviously the lowest, so the guard token would get discarded. We would re-roll the one. Whatever that value is, is what's set in that right slot, and there'd be a plus two on top of it. So just to illustrate how crazy this can change a combat from being something you think you can handle to something getting progressively worse quite quickly is if a guard token was discarded and I rolled the one in this case or this example I got a five and of course we'll be reverting back to the norm here in a second this is just a side example to show you how the guard token really can change things a five and a three combined is eight and then plus two for using the guard token on top of it is a ten and that is going to put you in the 10 plus range meaning now you're going to have three damage coming your way and that is one of the ways in which the enemy can toy with you so thankfully for us there was no guard token so we can skip past this and now we move to chaos actions and i highly recommend checking the solo rules section to get a full understanding around this i will show you how this works but again my cash is not very full at this point so it's going to be a pretty easy resolve but things resolve in a very interesting way if you have many many cards in the cash to pull now we know we're going to have a chaos action because there is a chaos icon on the combat card as you can see just below the dice for the enemy and it states just one so it is going to discard one of the chaos tokens that we have to do the chaos action which is going to have us interacting with that silver cache because well that's the only cache we have available currently which means we'll be revealing it now it's important to note i'm discarding one chaos token to do this if we had an example where where I had zero chaos tokens and I drew this combat card and it said to do a chaos action, we wouldn't do it because we wouldn't have the tokens. It's also fun because you'll see there's still going to be one chaos token left, which means the next round, if this thing is still alive, it is going to try and utilize chaos again against us if the combat card pulls that for it. There's two ways this can go. You're either performing one chaos action or you're performing two chaos actions. In this example, I'll show you how one works and you can check out the rulebook to see how two chaos actions work. The first thing we check is if there's any gold cards in the gold cache. And at this point, if there was, we would reveal the top card from the gold cache and then continue revealing more cards until we draw three cards of the same type or reveal a card of a different type. And if we reveal a card of a different type, you put the last revealed card, which is obviously different than everything else on the table, um, on the bottom of the gold cache. So it will still stay in the cache, it just won't add on top of the pain that's gonna be coming your way. And you're gonna see how this is very, very interesting in terms of changing up the combat mechanics in the game in a very unique way. Now, of course, our gold cache is empty, so we're going to move past the gold and check the silver, proceeding in the exact same way. But we only have one card in there, so this is going to be pretty easy to resolve. We're literally just flipping over the one card. There's no more cards to pull. Now, again, if we happen to have had three silver cards in there, we continue drawing cards, revealing them face up. And if any of them were of a different type or color, essentially, which you'll see in a moment, then basically that card goes to the bottom of the cache for the appropriate deck, which would be silver in this example. I've gone ahead and revealed my silver cash card. It ended up being a curse card. Now, the thing I really want to hammer home for solo gamers is the icon you see in the top left-hand corner of any of these chaos cards that you reveal when you're resolving combat. You want to completely ignore them. Don't look them up. Don't bother trying to understand what they are for. They're all around multiplayer, so they're going to have absolutely no use for you. You might see potentially one of the uh, enemy logos up in that top left-hand corner. Uh, like the animal icon, you might see arrows depicting different things, different directions. Don't worry about any of it. Just ignore it. What really matters is what's in the bulk center of the card in the different categories or rows per se. So in this one, there's two rows worth of icons to talk about. So let's get into the details on what this actually does to us. 
The building out of these stacks is something I really, really like. When I first started playing the game, I wasn't sure that I liked it, and the more I played it, the more I enjoyed it, because it really threw such an interesting wrench into the combat that you weren't expecting, because, well, silver cards are bad, and gold cards are worse, especially when resolving here for these Chaos tokens. So what I want to talk to you about now is the icons you can see on the left-hand side in each of the two sections. You'll see a Chaos icon there, a skull essentially, and then two cards sticking up or one card sticking up. So in this case, for this stack that I built out, there's only one card. So we go ahead and resolve the top one only. And if it had been two cards in this pile, based on me potentially having more silver cards in the cache to draw from, and the actual card type has to be the exact same in order for it to stay in the stack, then we'd be resolving the bottom. Just to give you an idea of other cards that are inside the deck in terms of different types of cards, you've got enchantments and mind control mixed in. Again, these are all going to change and vary the way the attacks are thrown at the heroes or potentially boosting what's going on with the enemies. And always remember when you're building these stacks per chaos token that you've spent, you're only going to continue to build them out if the next card drawn matches the same card type. If it doesn't, remember it's going back to the bottom of the appropriate cast cash pile. Now, the last thing I want to mention around resolving a chaos action for a enemy is, of course, if you don't have any cards in the gold cash or the silver cash, and the combat card tells you to go ahead and use a chaos token, and you even have a chaos token to use on the enemy, you still aren't going to resolve the chaos action because, well, there's nothing to draw from. We're now at the tail end of the monster attack phase and there is one more step and it's a really important one. This is all about mitigation and dealing with what has just been thrown at you because there are some surprises that have come into the mix. Initially, you're going, well, there's a combat value. Oh, the air elemental made a change. Oops, there goes the chaos token and here comes a minus three to a hero roll. Things can change quite quickly and you're thinking, well, maybe it would get to a point where you can't really control anything or have any kind Kind of impact on what happened but you can and this is what's really cool at this stage at the very tail end of the monster attack phase the hero player gets to use guard tokens abilities and items that they have in order to try to deal with what's just been thrown at them now, when you start the game, you're not going to have many items or many abilities unlocked in the first place, so really it's going to be guard tokens as your main focus, especially with the character I'm controlling right now. You're always going to have four guard tokens to start, and I can use one right now instead of using it for its blue side, which gives you a plus two to whatever roll you're doing, as well as allowing you to re-roll one of your dice, we can use it for its opposite side, which is in red. So it becomes a question of, do I want to use a guard token at this point in time? Knowing that, yes, I can get guard tokens by visiting different hexes as rewards for maybe taking out other creatures or liberating different areas or completing certain quest things along those lines. So this might be the right time to do it, but we want to do a little bit of a look at what it's going to actually do in terms of its effects. So first off, we know a red-sided guard token usage for a hero against an enemy is going to minus two off the combat value. Well, the combat Combat value right now is a four so it's already quite low so if I was to go ahead and actually use this I'd be reducing it down to two which would still place it in the range of two to nine which means two damage would still be coming at me anyway so re-rolling one of these dice would actually be more risky at this point especially because they're both low values anyway there's a chance it could actually get a higher value and then the minus two would just end up negating it and making it a pointless usage so there will be times where it doesn't make sense to use it but more often than not it's going to make sense to help you out especially when you get down to it in combat where your health is getting extremely low and you're at risk of actually losing the combat you're going to probably want to pull those guard tokens out to save yourself so I've chosen to go ahead and just take the damage, which we know being at a value of four is going to land in the two to nine range on the Gecko's card for two damage coming to my wizard. All right, it's not the end of the world. We've dropped from six down to four using the horizontal hero token. 
We finished explaining the monster attack phase fully, and now we can move to the hero healing phase. That's right, this is the second time a hero healing phase comes around inside of a combat round. So we went through the first one at the very beginning, then you have the monster attack phase, then you have another hero healing phase we're going through right now, and then the heroes get to attack in the hero attack phase. So the reason I like this is because it gives you two spots during a combat round to be able to use things like potions to try to keep yourself alive in tough battles. And it might not just be potions, it could be scrolls, it could be an opal, a diamond, a water essence. There's a whole bunch of examples of different abilities and things you can get that can potentially heal you up during combat. Let's talk about that hero attack phase because it's happening right now as I'm choosing not to do any healing whatsoever. So let's go ahead into the first step, which is to apply any curse effects that are currently uh, in play from chaos action. So you can see, of course, the minus three. I need to remember that's going to be a negative on my combat roll, which is not nice. Next up, we're gonna be checking for any abilities, items, or fire essences I want to use during combat. At this point in time, so early on, I don't have much, but I can guarantee you very very quickly you're going to start to gain things that are going to be able to be used in combat to help you out and then now we're going to go into a what using a weapon so basically specifying which weapon we're going to use rolling our two d6s for our hero applying any elemental effects adding any additional tick ups to the die of hope based on our roll and then we can jump into using guard tokens any abilities and items we have any die of hope usage and then of course applying the hero roll penalty and that will give us our end result in terms of the total number of damage we're going to be throwing back at this individual. I'm going to use the Staff of Fire for this attack. It has a range of 3 to 5, 6 to 9, and 10 plus for 1 damage, 2 damage, and 3 damage respectively. So we're obviously hoping to get the most amount of damage possible. The Gecko is a 4 damage character, so this is going to take us at least uh, 2 attacks to get through and kill this thing if everything goes as planned. Let's go ahead and roll our two D6s and see what we get. All right, so we ended up getting a three and a two, which are low rolls. It just squeaked under the requirements to uptick the Die of Hope. You'll see on a roll of two to five for the hero on the top section there, we're gonna add one to the Die of Hope, which is going to allow us to potentially spend it, as you can see, for a clover if we want to in order to boost our roll. Now, of course, with the curse in play already taking three away from us, it might not be the best time to do it in this combat round, but the Die of Hope keeps all the values it constantly gains over combat rounds to be used in future ones as well, just not in a future separate fight. Now, similar to the enemy, we're also affected by the Air Elemental, which is going to have us take the highest die that we have and flip it to its opposite side. It's worth noting, and I didn't mention this when we were doing this for the enemy, if you roll the dice and both of the results are the exact same, the Air Essence effect basically doesn't happen. Nothing changes. So if I had to roll two twos, we don't flip anything. So literally flipping the die from a three to its opposite side, which is a four, we get to uptick our overall combat value. Not bad. And now we get to the part of the hero attack phase near the very end where we have to make some decisions around whether we want to mitigate anything that's happened here in terms of using guard tokens, abilities, items, the die of hope that is now upticked. Now, it's not always going to go up. You may not have anything there, but if you do, you could use it if you wanted to. And as you go down to that card, if you actually save the die of hope up, it can become actually even more powerful or give you different bonuses, which is kind of cool. Uh, so in this case here, I'm going in with a six on the roll but the curse is going to affect me for three so really I just got a three which puts me just barely in the first range for the staff of fire to allow me to do one damage so the question is is it worth pushing things further with maybe a gar token or the usage of the uh, die of hope to get me to the next range to get two damage on it instead so this is a tough call and I'll tell you guys why. So we know we have negative three coming against us. If I was to use a guard token, the guard token on the blue side gives us an automatic plus two and a reroll. So the plus two along with using the one on the die of hope would be three. So three there would negate the three from the curse, meaning we'd be at a balanced approach just in terms of whatever comes up on the dice. We currently have a four and a two. If I use a guard token, not only am I getting a plus two out of it that helps me with that whole 
cancellation of the curse, but it also allows me to re-roll one of my dice so I could re-roll the two. And taking a look at the Staff of Fire here, if I was to re-roll the two, looking at the odds here, I already got a four. You can see I'm sitting right in between three and five for one damage. So if I re-rolled this die and got a two or higher, I could uptick my damage by one. So is it worth the spending of the Gar token to do this? Well, it comes down to you and thinking about what's going to happen later on. Now, in this case with the Gecko, we know there's going to be no more chaos usage whatsoever because currently there's no more caches to pull from. So this will likely be the worst attack coming from the Gecko. If we can handle it, and if we only did one damage, that would be, I guess, okay. But we would need to pull off at least three damage in the next round to guarantee to wipe it out. Otherwise, this is going three rounds, and my character, if it keeps taking an average of two hits per round, is not going to make it unless I want to burn my heal and token. So I think I might actually go ahead here and use the Gar to add to plus tick down the die of hope. This is going to flat out help me to uh, deal with the curse and we're just going to reroll the die right now and see if we happen to land what we want. If we get really lucky we might even pull off a three damage because if I land a six on this that will work. So here we go. Oh, we got ourselves a three. So it wasn't good enough to get the uh, the three damage, but it was good enough to uptick us to two damage. So it's still worth it. And just like that, two damage has been placed on the Gecko. And at this point, we can do some cleanup here. We're going to discard any tokens that were used, whether they're Chaos tokens or Gar tokens. They're all going to the uh, respective pools. Also, we're going to have this uh, Chaos stack here removed as well. We're also going to take away the combat card, and we're going to go into another round of combat. So now that I'm not explaining all the different uh, intricacies of the combat, even most of which didn't even need to occur during this combat, because this is a quite a simplistic one, I'm going to move forward and you'll see how combat resolves when you're speeding things up because, well, half these things we don't need to check every single time. The next combat card is in. I've gone ahead and skipped right past the hero healing phase because I decided I didn't want to heal at all. I'm still happy being at four. I'll use the potion if I really, really need to. Uh, but as of right now, this is the next uh, card for the monster combat wise. It's a one and a six. So let's place the dice on there and then we'll go through the motions we saw earlier in a much faster pace. The dice have been set. We take a look at the Die of Hope to see whether the range of combat values we just got off the card match inside 10 and 12. It does not, so there's going to be no uptick on the die. Thanks to that Air Elemental, the 6, which is the highest die that the enemy has, is going to flip over to its opposite side, and it becomes a 1, giving us the best roll ever in terms of the most weakest roll the enemy could have possibly rolled here. Now, it's still going to do damage, but at least it's going to stay in that 2 category. And of course, regardless of all of this down here in terms of it wanting to resolve 2 Chaos Tokens and a Gar Token, it can't. Because even though I have the Chaos Token to to spend for at least one stack creation, I have no cash cards in the reserve to draw at this point. So I'm gonna take the hit, which is going to be two damage, which will drop me from four down to two. Time for the hero roll to see how we do. We just need two damage to get through and we're doing all right. So we got ourselves a one and a four. So we have two different numbers there. And we know by rolling this value, actually it equals five, which on the die of hope allows us to uptick it by one as we're just on the far end of that range. The elemental is also not exactly the nicest individual in the world. It's going to take our four because the two dice are two different results and flip it over to its opposite side, changing it to a three. And that's just a little bit brutal because we now only have four on the dice. We have one we can add in from the die of hope, which would be a five, but that's not enough to get us into that second range of six to nine uh, with a six to get two damage on this gecko and kill it. So we are going to, unfortunately, if we want to continue to kind of effectively not lose the battle, seeing as our health is going down quite quickly, I do have that health potion though, and I can use it in order to save my hide here after this round if I wanted to drag it on to a third round, but I really don't. So let's just go ahead and spend the guard token. This is gonna give us a plus two, which is really, without even having to reroll the die, automatically gonna give us the success, but we'll reroll this die anyway. And we got ourselves a six. Now it's just crazy. So six, three, plus two is 11. That's three damage going through, and that is going to be way more than enough to take out the gecko. 
So what happens when you take out an enemy? Well, you get to reap the rewards and the rewards can be very, very nice. Now, the thing I want to talk about just down the bottom left-hand corner is the Die of Hope might have some stored up usage that you didn't end up using during combat. This is basically going to sit like this. And then when you go into your next combat at the very beginning, the rule book instructs you to reset this back to zero. Now, I'm not familiar enough with the game in terms of all the scenarios that are involved as to whether or not the Die of Hope can be used in any other instance to progress scenario specific rules or anything like that but i would highly recommend not down ticking the die of hope until you run into combat just in case there's a special usage in one of those scenarios Flipping over the enemy, the card is going to tell you, are you in the range of 0 to 15 for reputation? If you are, you get to gain the rewards depicted below, which is going to be 2 reputation, which we're going to move ourselves up on the track in a moment. And also we're going to draw a silver card, which will go into our hand. And at the same time as we do that, we're going to place one silver card in the cache for the enemy. So I have my silver card reward here. I've also placed a silver card in the cache. It's worth mentioning again, as I talked about earlier in the video, the cards that go into your hand, silver and gold wise, only matter for the card backs. Don't bother looking at the front side of them and wondering what they mean or how you can use them. Essentially, these cards are used just as they are for their card backs, gold and silver. Once you have four silver ones in hand, you can discard them at any time to gain one gold. If you have one gold card in hand, you can discard at any time to get one gold and you can also use them for any special rules of a chosen scenario if there are any and in this case there aren't way up in the top left hand corner we have the reputation track i'm currently at zero but now i've been bumped up to two which has a book icon on it all the book symbols shown on the reputation track are just visual reminders of the values needed to unveil new tiles from your hero specific tile deck. You can see here reputation two tiles right on the top. Now when you're setting this tile deck up next to your character board, I recommend grouping them by the reputation values starting with the lowest down to the highest. In a little bit, we'll talk about unveiling hero tiles as well as training these new abilities and where you can do them and how. Next up, you have a choice as to whether or not you want to take this creature as a trophy. So do you want to actually have that to potentially cash in at a hunter like we found earlier, which this enemy happens to be one of the five to six different enemies we had to find in order to bring back to complete one of the quests? Yes, I definitely want to take this as a trophy. And you can see here that just doing regular combat in the world can have ripple effects in terms of the different areas you can interact with to get rewards and upgrade your hero. So I'm going to slot that dead gecko trophy into one of my three bag slots so I can carry this thing to the hunter to get a reward in the future. Next, you're definitely going to want to take a look at the hex you're currently on because not only did that tell you what level enemy you're going up against, but also the loot you're going to gain from it as well. And in this case, we're gaining three gold. Gone ahead and gathered up some coins. So now we have some money, which gives us flexibility, especially seeing as we just liberated a merchant. At this point, you're going to want to do a double check to see whether you gained any more uh, silver cards or gold cards from the actual hex you were standing on that, of course, would then have you place more cards into the cash, which if you put up to four cards or even have four cards that are silver in the cash, you need to immediately discard them to the bottom of the deck and replace it with a gold card in the cash. Next up, you're going to take one Gar token for every two points remaining on the Die of Hope. And any unspent points cannot be used for the next combat action as the Die of Hope will be reset. So as I mentioned earlier, because I didn't get up to two, I don't get a Gar token. So at the end of the day, this is just going to go back to zero. And I don't believe there is any kind of in-between usage for this die beyond this. The next thing you need to do, which you definitely don't want to forget about because it's going to affect endgame scoring, is to place a token on the hex because you have successfully dealt with it and need to mark it for endgame scoring. You don't do this, you don't get that credit, so definitely make sure you do it. If the combat action took place on a hex with merchants, alchemists, or one of the three hexes of a Dragon Slayer Towers tile, place your trade token on that hex. So in this case, I liberated a merchant, so I'm going to be using my trade token which is specific to my hero, which is an orangish red. And I'm going to be placing it right on the hex that I'm currently standing on. This is also going to allow me to actually interact with the merchant as well. Now for other cases, if the combat action took place on a mining hex, you're going to place two interaction tokens, hammer pick side up, 
on that location, and if the combat action took place in any other hex, you're going to place a hero token there instead. There is talk in the rulebook about checking to make sure you don't have excess items beyond the three slots or bag slots that you have, because of course you could potentially gain some things and need to basically juggle things around in your inventory, so you do this check now. I'll leave you to read that uh, quick blurb inside of the rulebook. It also talks about immediately taking a trade action afterwards, after the combat, so if that's the case, you do have the flexibility to then go ahead and wait a little bit longer before having to uh, essentially make sure your bag is in order. So that sums up combat. The only thing that you didn't see there was me go through potentially getting two chaos stacks, which would have been awesome to do, but that's not going to happen until a little bit later into your adventure. And honestly, if you understand how to resolve one of the chaos stacks, you're going to be able to go ahead and handle the second one. No problem. It's all detailed in the solar rules section. But again, in terms of time to complete combat, it might seem like it takes a long time. It's just in this video, in order to explain the ins and outs of it and the timing of everything to ensure that you have a great understanding if you're using this as a learn to play, which I hope you are, uh, that obviously adds a lot of time to combat. And as you saw in the second round, things moved extremely fast when you know exactly what you're doing. I want to reiterate this again because I found it to be extremely useful when learning how to resolve combat inside of this game that there is a process map or process flow that is a separate file which is likely on the publisher's website if not on board game geek that shows how combat should be resolved in a process flow so that you can see basically what you're supposed to be checking uh, in a way that makes a lot of logical sense when i looked at this it was specific to multiplayer and i really went back to the publisher and asked them whether or not they'd be able to put one together for the solo gamers because the flow of combat is different and the checks are a little bit different here and there so so go and find that solo specific one. It will definitely help you to ensure that you're flowing through combat correctly. Now it's likely that somebody's wondering what happens if your hero dies. Well, if your hero dies in combat, they lose all the remaining move points that they have allotted inside of those tokens I showed you earlier. So basically any remaining movement points you had are gone. And you're going to resurrect at the church. You may also use any remaining points from the Die of Hope to gain Gar tokens back. So you get for every two points you spend, you get a Gar token. And then you continue playing your turn using any remaining action tokens, items, and abilities, including ones that generate move points. It's also worth mentioning, of course, however many times you die does have an impact on end of game scoring. Now the differences for solo play is that when your hero dies, instead of a monster player taking one of your hero tokens, you're going to place one chaos token on the illustration of your character on your hero board. And you're also going to remember to add one gold card to the cache when you draw a gold card after being resurrected. So these are some tweaks to the solo rules found on page 33. You're definitely going to want to make sure you don't miss that. And as I alluded to just moments ago regarding uh, an effect, a negative effect against your end game scoring, for however many chaos tokens are sitting on your player board based on the number of deaths you've had, you're going to reduce your overall reputation by two for each of them. So don't let these things stack up. So moving into my next turn here, the only action I have available left to spend, if I want to spend it, because I could actually save it for the next round, and I might do it, but first let's just talk about what I can do with this. I have the ability to use it for just one movement, or I could try to mine something. Well, I'm currently not in a location where I can mine anything, so really I'd just be using this for one move. So what I might end up doing is just saving this in the fourth slot to show you guys that basically when I replenish for the next game round, I'm going to have four actions going into the next game round, which is pretty pretty awesome. So you can choose to store that fourth one strategically, whether it's a trade action or it happens to be something related to combat or, uh, you know, the market, for instance, or trade. I mean, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the fact that even though I'm sitting on a liberated merchant right now, and I really do want to do a trade action, which you can see all of that detailed out here in the book here in front of you. I still need to have this action available to do it. So I am going to have to wait until the next round anyway. So I think it just makes perfect sense to kind of store this one in the fourth position and reset for the next round. 
So I've gone ahead and upticked the inner track, which tracks the number of rounds. We have seven rounds inside of the hunt scenario. We're now going into round number two. And as you saw earlier, we now have two reputation as we slowly build that up. And if we get the ability to actually interact with a trade action in the merchant area, we're gonna be able to take advantage of the fact that we hit that book icon on the reputation track. So as with every single new round, the first three slots are always populated the same. Because I carried over one of my actions from the previous round, I use one of the duplicates for my hero to place into that fourth slot. And of course, it has to be the action I didn't use from the previous round. This is really cool because it really does allow for some strategy and thinking forward about what you plan to do in the future. Well, I know what I wanna do right out of the gates, and that is to interact with the merchant and take a trade action to do it. So by discarding that trade action token, you can see the south of my miniature there. I'll be placing that in the discard area next to my hero board in a second. I can now interact with the merchant that I've liberated here. And there's a bunch of things I can do. I could purchase items here with the gold that I have. I could sell items I already own and try to make some extra money. I could try and heal myself. Uh, it's worth mentioning, if you're looking to try and purchase Gar tokens, you can only do this at Dragon Slayer Towers only. And currently, I'm assuming these are not going to be sitting in any Chapter 1 areas. You probably have to progress a little bit further into the land to find those. And then you have the unveiling of Hero Tiles, which is going to tie into your reputation that we've now hit on that book icon. So that means we can actually take a look at the different Hero Tiles that are available to us. And then we can even train in an ability that we We've unveiled, which is pretty cool. We can also unlock hero or equipment slots here too. Here's a look very up close of one of the many different great organizers that you can pick up for this game. I highly, highly recommend them because not only are they useful for storing the game way, set up and tear down, all that kind of bonus that you typically expect from some type of organizational tray inside of a box. They also work for gameplay, which I absolutely love. Not only do they have sections to store the tiles, they have discard areas above them, and they have just a really easy door that slides onto the front to keep them all contained when they go back in the box. Like it's just an absolutely phenomenal organization of these tiles because otherwise they'd just be all over the place. Now I want to talk about this particular one because it's super tall. This is the Places of Trade organizer and it depicts merchants, alchemists, and dragon slayer towers in terms of the things that can come from these different locations when you do a trade action on them. So we're going to go down now to the board which is where we have four different different items or things that we can potentially buy, purchase from each of these different locations. Now, where I'm currently at is the merchant, so I'll be focusing on the left-hand column. At the bottom of the tower on the left-hand side, the column we're focusing on is tied to the merchant that we're currently at right now. And it has four items up for sale currently. And you'll see at the very top of it, there is a chest. This can house things like gems and essences. So that's one way you can buy your way into getting some of these things. You can also gain some of those types of things by interacting or having a confrontation with elementals in the game world and other ways of actually getting these beyond just buying them straight out. The cost of them, of course, is inside the coin, and it's the largest number depicted. The smaller number that's in brackets below it is the selling price if you happen to own it and want to get rid of it. And of course, when you're here at a place of trade, you could sell things that you have if you have additional armor you don't need anymore. Now, going down below that, we've got a blue and a red. We have different types of armor there. There's also slots on these particular tiles so you can actually upgrade these with different benefits and you can see how many slots are up in the top left hand corner so each of those different pieces of armor have a slot available and then down at the very bottom we have the iron mace so if we wanted to buy a more powerful weapon that might have a better range of getting higher damage for instance now, a rule that I absolutely love inside this rulebook is it states at any point during a trade action, you may completely change the offer at the place of trade you're visiting. You can do this before or after purchasing an item. And even if you do not purchase anything, the first time you change the offer during an action is free. And then any subsequent changes to the offer during the same action costs you a gold. So if you go into a place and you just look down its you know column of things available and go, none of this stuff interests me, you get a free refund 
refresh of different items. So basically, at, in a free sense, you have up to eight potentially that could be useful. And then if you want to keep paying your way beyond that, you might be able to go after the one or basically buy your way towards the one you're really gunning for. As I mentioned, you can, of course, sell things. So, of course, the brackets below the cost will tell you how much you can sell it for. The sold tiles go into an appropriate discard pile. Sold gems and essences go back to the supply. And sold hero tiles that are equipment are removed from the game. There's a special rule around selling natural resources, and you'll see a lot more around these when you start mining in those mountain range areas. And I'll just point you towards the rule book to find the rules around how you can go about selling those and what you gain when you do so. You can also heal, so for one gold, you can heal your hero by the value depicted on the trade board according to your current location. So at the very bottom of the column we're in, you'll see a heart with a five, and there's a hand underneath of it. So if we pay one gold, we can heal ourselves up by five, which actually wouldn't be a bad idea seeing as I'm at two and my max health is six. It probably is worth it to spend a gold just to get that boost, and that allows me to hold on to my potion. I've gone ahead and spent a gold in order to heal up. We're now to our maximum six health. Now, the thing that I want to do most beyond, of course, healing at this place of trade was unveiling hero tiles because, as you remember, we hit two on the reputation track, which allows us to go into these tile decks now so long as we pay a gold, which I'm going to do right now, to unveil as many tiles as we have reputation to do so, basically giving us a big pool to choose from and train from. So there is strategy around should you wait till maybe you've got four six, nine, whatever reputation, so that when you come into a place of trade, you pay one gold and get to reveal a mountain of tiles versus going in every single time you potentially could unveil two at a time and paying a gold each time. It could become quite costly. For the purposes of this video though, I don't really care and I really want to show you what's underneath at least reputation level two for this particular character. So let's go ahead and unveil those tiles now. Now it's also worth mentioning that at every level of reputation unlock as you go through these hero tiles you won't always have two to pull for each level so at two you have two at four you may have two but as you get into higher numbers it might just be one now the reason there are two as you go along in certain cases is going to give you a fork in the road a decision to make you have two unveiled tiles right now i do anyway in this case i have lord of portals and the merchant i have to choose one of these to keep in my pool here and the other one gets discarded to the game box and I cannot access it anymore. Every single hero in the game has her own full size reference sheet for the tiles in their hero tiles deck as well as any special tiles that relate to the character or any items. So if you flip this over there's also more information specific to the character. So you can see here Lord of Portals is listed as well as the merchant tile so we can actually take a look at both of them to determine which one's the best fit for this particular play. The Lord of Portal states, outside of combat, choose one of the following options. Teleport to any portal on the map or teleport one hex away. Now it states underneath that even if the event that prevents portals from being used is in play, you can still use Lord of Portals. It's that strong. The other option we have here is Merchant. The timing is, of course, during a trade action, which would be really what we're into right now. Choose one of the following options. Reduce the purchasing price of one item or one service, healing, unveiling, or training by one gold to a minimum cost of zero. So that's kind of nice over time. You cannot combine this effect with any other effect, allowing you to reduce the price. And in addition to the standard rules for changing the offer, you may change the offer up to two additional times for free. This makes for quite the tough choice, but out of the two of them, even though literally in my mind, these are split 50-50 in terms of how valuable they can be, depending on which way you want to play or where you want to get your benefits from, I'm going to sit with the Lord of Portal. So we're going to discard the Merchant one, although that is extremely tempting. Now it's worth mentioning this is just unveiling the hero tiles into the pool. We have not trained this ability on our character yet to even have access to it. And what's even more important is to ensure the symbols that are on this tile match one of the available slots on our player board so we can actually train this ability with our character. 
Now, of course, every single hero tile that's in the stack can potentially be placed into one of the slots that's on the left-hand side of the player board because they're built for this character. But what matters even more is where you can place them based on these icons right here, plus which one of these slots is actually open. So as of right now, this icon here in the bottom right does match the icon here in the open slot, the only one I have available. So I could place it in there by doing some training, which is what I'm going to do next. But I wouldn't be able to make use of any of these other slots unless during this trade action I decided I wanted to spend the appropriate gold or use an essence of some type in order to unlock it. As I mentioned way earlier in the video there is a line, a faint line between them so you can go either way whether it's spending gold or spending some type of resource that you've gained in order to unlock these slots giving you the ability to train these awesome hero tiles that you unveil. Well, it's a good thing that I held on to one gold because that's all I have left and I need this to pay the training cost which is shown in the bottom left hand corner of this tile to allow me to place it into a slot that matches the icon in the bottom right. And just like that, we've now trained our way up, gained a new ability, and in this way, as you progress through the game, your character is going to build up, become stronger, and be able to take on further chapters of exploration as you continue your journey throughout whichever scenario you're playing. Continuing my turn here, I want to actually travel, I think, northwest and actually confront one of the elementals. Why do I want to do this? Well, there's a potential to gain essences and other additional bonuses from confronting an elemental. You can only do this once, and when you do it, you'll place a token on it once you're done this encounter or this confrontation. And it's also worth mentioning that, again, you can always move through elementals that are sitting on hexes. They're not going to block you. They're not going to stop you but they're certainly going to affect your roles. So I've gone ahead and discarded one of my mining actions in order to actually use it for its movement of one and that's going to allow me to move northwest into the space with the elemental, the wind one. We're going to go ahead and take a look at the reference cards for the elementals now because we're confronting one. Every single different type of elemental you can run into in the game has its own reference card here and this is what you're going to be rolling against. When you move into a space with an elemental, you would normally pay one gold to every opponent who already has an interaction token in the hex, but of course we're playing solo, we don't have to worry about that, but what you do have to worry about is, have you already been into that hex before and already placed an elemental token, because you've already confronted that elemental before. You cannot do that twice. I'm going in here for the first time, and because I am confronting it, I am going ahead and placing my elemental token in there face up, which means no matter what happens during this confrontation, I cannot do this confrontation again in the future however you can see there's an elemental off to the right there i could go that way to try and get more end game points or potentially any kind of cool rewards from this confrontation so now that we've done this we're going to make a hero roll we're going to modify things as normal which means the uh, air elemental is still going to mess with us and then we're going to see how well we did based on the reference card let's go ahead with our roll hopefully good things will happen but we know the air elemental is going to be messing with the highest die i roll oh my gosh I got a five and a six. That's a fantastic roll, but really bad went up against the air elemental because it's going to flip the highest one, which is a six over to a one. So now we've dropped down to six total, which isn't as good as it was originally. Uh, that puts us on the second row here, which isn't bad. We would take two damage. We would gain a reward tile. We have the ability to teleport and we get a guard token back. So not bad. I don't really want to take the damage and I'm kind of gunning for what's going on in that third row. Now this has me wondering, and that's mainly because I have such a good roll still remaining that I could use a Gara token in order to get a plus two, re-roll the one in order to try and get to nine and over. Why do I want to try to push for that so hard? Well, I don't really want to take two damage from the six to eight row, even though there is a Gara token in there, the ability to use a portal. Uh, and there's also a level two treasure tile, which is pretty awesome. But I can get that same level two treasure tile down below without any damage. And the best bonus of all rather than getting the portal uh, movement and the guard token is instead I would get an air essence and an air essence is really really cool 
it's basically going to allow you to go into combat using the air essence in a specific combat that you want to use it in in order to have the monster only use a single die for the duration of the combat which could be really useful for getting those level two monsters we need for the scenario if i could make them a little bit weaker it'd be easier to take them out so I say let's do it. Let's go ahead and spend our third Gar token. We're getting a little low on those. We might want to try and find a way to replenish that. Maybe go after some encounters in the future that would allow us to get that as a reward. But for right now, I'm being greedy and going after the Air Essence. Hopefully we nail this. So we have five, six, seven. We just need a two or higher on this roll to pull it off. Hopefully I don't see a one. Oh, just barely got in there. All right, so that is enough. We are going to get a level two treasure tongue and a Pull that right down and also place the air essence on my hero's board. Now this item is awesome. It's perfect for my character. It is a three heal, which can be used anytime. And you know that because the icon at the very top of the tile, it lets us know that if we decide to sell the thing, we'd only get one gold for it. But the ability to be able to just heal myself for three when I only have six max health, I mean, that's half my health back. That can really, really help me out. Now, just so you understand, scrolls falls into the bucket of scrolls and potions. They're single use items. You may use them immediately when you gain them or you can store them for later use so obviously i'm going to kind of hold on to it for now this is why the cost on it's not that crazy because it's not something i'm going to be able to reuse over and over and over again but it could get me out of a really bad situation so you'll see now all three of my bag slots are taken up and I do have a plan to head to the hunter shack in order to get rid of the trophy that's taking up one of my bag slots and get some more rewards. And also down the bottom right, I've got the air essence in a slot as well. So at this point, we're completely done confronting the elemental. It's worth mentioning, even though I confronted it and placed a token here, I don't remove it. It's not like the elemental is now gone and its effects don't affect anything around it. It's still there. It's just you can only confront it once to gain a benefit from it and try to do that. Of course, I was able to avoid getting any swipes from it and taking damage, which was nice, but I had to use a guard token to make that happen, which is has its own cost to it. So at this point in time, the question is, how do I get myself down? down to that quest to cash it in. Well, I can't see any reason why I shouldn't use Lord of the Portals right now. In order to use one of these abilities that I've trained, I'm going to go ahead and tap it by turning it sideways to say that it's been exhausted and used. I can only use it once per round, and at the beginning of the next round, it will come back upright again. I'm choosing to just use it to move me to another portal, which just also so happens to be just one space away. And really there's two different ways I could use this particular tile. As I mentioned earlier, I can either teleport to a portal space or just move one hex adjacent to me. But in this case, I just really need to do the exact same thing, which is just move one space to make it easier to get to the quest. Now, why am I bothering to do this? Because I want to kind of hold on to the combat one. I'm not planning on doing any combat this round, so it'd be nice to keep it in the fourth position for the next round. So what I'll do, knowing that I have one movement for free from the uh, Lord of Portals ability that I just used, I'll move one with that, and then I'll use this one here for one movement. And this is going to lead me into another section of content I want to talk about in this game around free actions. Now, you've seen me taking actual actions, whether it be a trade action, a mining action. Actually, we haven't seen a real mining action yet. We have seen a combat action, and we have been trading at the uh, merchant as well. But we haven't seen any free actions yet. So what can you do as a free action? Well, you can visit the church. So if I choose to go back to the church, I can try to... Well, you go there if you die and you resurrect, but you can also go there to... To heal as well so that's an option for you um, and then on top you can also go there to buy healing potions which is another good reason to go back there the other thing you can do as a free action is if you happen to be on a treasure tile and we saw two of them pop up on the map and they're actually both depicted one's very south and one's just to the southeast uh, they're those locations with the holes in the ground we basically can as a free action go dig up some treasure uh, the other thing we can do is confront an elemental so actually as you notice when we went and confronted front of the elemental we did a free action i didn't tell you that that was kind of a secret which i should have let you know of, but it didn't take us or it didn't cause us to have to use the uh, combat specific action token it was free by just moving in what else is free fulfilling a quest like we are gonna do right now which is after moving into this location here at the hunter shack we're not gonna fulfill the quest for the gecko by cashing in our trophy 
As you can see on the quest card, there's two of them. One of them has the gecko right square in the middle. There are lines dividing up what other types of trophies I could have brought back to complete a quest. Gecko is going to work for the one that's right underneath of it. So let's go ahead and gain some rewards from it. After drawing two tiles as depicted at the bottom of the far right quest card, I've got two of them face up in front of me and these come strictly from the hunter shack and both of them are going to help me with storage, whether it's for scroll it even states down below can be used for gems or gars or any or essences and a number of other things which is pretty handy on the left and on the right we could use that one for additional items and we could also potentially just take them and put and sell one of them uh, to a place of trade in order to get some money but the thing to remember here is the actual reward area shows two different color tones on this particular tile meaning you're going to grab two but you only get to keep one of them so unfortunately i do have to pay pick just one, we're also going to gain one reputation. One quick thing I want to mention about fulfilling a quest is if you happen to go to a location that of course in this solo capacity you have two available quests you can go back and with one free action for fulfilling a quest have both of the trophies for two different available face of quests and resolve them at the exact same time so if you want to be super efficient you can go that route. Now at this point in time, we're not going to go ahead and flip over the unrevealed card, the other quest at this location just yet, but that will happen at the end of the round as we move into the next one. Both rewards were actually really, really good, but I decided to go with the backpack, slotted it into the sack position here. Now, what you're probably wondering is, is it states that the backpack can hold two more items, so where do they go? Well, the actual backpack will take up a sack position here, so one of the three, but to the right of it, I can have up to two items inside of it. And again, of course, if I don't find this useful or don't want it, I can always try and sell it. The other thing you don't want to forget about is when you actually fulfill a quest, you're going to go ahead and not place any tokens on the hex at all unlike a majority of resolving many other aspects of the game instead you're going to actually take the encounter card or the quest card that you, you completed and place it next to your player board for end game scoring I'm going to go ahead and declare end of round so at this point we're going to replenish up the action tokens and of course the one I didn't use will go in the fourth position just like that we're all squared away couple other things to get resolved here would be to bring back the Lord of Portals back to its refreshed state. We're also going to go ahead and unveil the other quest at the Hunter's Lodge. And just like that, the other quest allows us to go after a grizzly, shadow beast, or a bat in order to succeed at it. So of course, you're going to want to make sure that you're upticking the round track every single time going into the next round. So we are in the inner track for round tracking. It's at three currently. And we also, based on the reputation we gained just recently, are up to three reputation. It's kind of creepy that those things seem to be aligning right now, but that will definitely not always be the case. So that is going to wrap up the gameplay portion of this video. You saw two full rounds with much explanation throughout to give an idea as to how to traverse and get started in Uthea. Now, there is a ton more with this game. Don't think what you saw here is everything there is to do. There is a lot of aspects of the game we haven't even seen yet. There's a lot of tiles we haven't even uncovered yet. And there's all kinds of different abilities and different uh, components that are even sitting in these trays we haven't even touched on yet so what I'm gonna do is quickly touch on a couple of them that I think are highlights from the rest of them and then we're gonna wrap this video up now Uthea comes with an appendix which is really helpful it will help to explain not only cards and what they mean even if there's icons all over them but it also explains a number of different aspects of gameplay some we've seen and some we haven't things like scrolls and potions or chests and flasks armor jewelry weapons natural resources which we never got a chance to actually do a mining action in one of those mountain range areas to gain some of those but that's another interesting facet of the game then we have gems essences elemental how the cards work, the quests, the event cards. There's even an achievement sheet inside the game so you can strive to actually unlock achievements as you play. As an example, on page 18 and 19, we can see natural resources laid out as well as gems and essences. Now, these are very important aspects of the gameplay and they provide a variety of different ways to interact with the world. The natural resources can, of course, be gathered and used and they're going to be gathered from things like mountains and lakes and caves. And you're going to be able to potentially sell these things, cash them in for quests. You also have the gems in the bottom left-hand corner. They're depicted in terms of 
their different abilities. So if you find a ruby, for instance, it's a permanent effect and it can increase your maximum health and your current health by one. So you can find gems that can really alter the gameplay. Essences, we actually gained an air essence, but there's a water, fire, and earth. Of course, because of the four different types of elementals in the game, you have all of those as well. So as I mentioned, depending on which terrain hex you're going to actually mine, you're going to find resources in that area based on this breakout right here. So if you're in a mountain range area, you're going to find things like uh, ore, different types of ore, quite a few of them, or raw resources. And in the lakes, you're going to find things like pearls, and you'll still find things like raw resources like sapphires and rubies and emeralds and opals, for instance. And then down below in the cave area, you're going to find diamonds among a number of other things. And of course, once these things become gems and you actually have them and then they can become things like permanent effects they can be after hero rolls they can be outside of combat and these are all benefits on both sides of the token so we have a number of them depicted here there's also a couple more at the top of the next page for diamonds and demon stones and then underneath that you have the essences and you saw me actually get an air essence as we played through and it does detail exactly when and how these things are used. There's also earth essences you can get and water essences, fire as well for all the different elemental types you can potentially confront. So what can you use these gems for that I mentioned just moments ago? Well, I mentioned this actually while we were going through a couple rounds of gameplay, that there are certain slots on certain equipment that you can actually put these gems onto and then take advantage of their bonuses. You can also strive to go after armor sets. You can get sets of three, four, or five, and they're going to provide benefits for you. So all in all, inside the world of Euthea, there is a lot to see and do and explore. And I can tell you right now, in terms of getting your money's worth, this game is definitely going to do just that. There is a lot here to uncover and to explore. There's elite monsters you can run into. There's special tiles we didn't even get into that can throw all kinds of different things into the equation. Of course, you've only ever seen Chapter 1 tiles revealed. You haven't even seen Chapter 2, 3, and beyond. There's all kinds of different things to explore. And I really hope this overview video gives you a good idea as to what you can expect inside this game. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of what you saw here and for those of you that are already playing Euthea let me know what your thoughts are thanks again for watching and as always keep on rolling solo